Oh, there she is. Okay, that's what I was like, where Okay. All right, you guys, so great. So we're here um, in Ramirez Canyon. This is your park. This is part of our public uh, heritage. So we're going to hear about it and, and the workings of the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and their sister agency, the MRCA, and some of the cool stuff they're doing. Um, so we'll, we'll do our close up. I know you guys are like, this is awesome, this is cool. When we're done, if you guys you know, have a few minutes, if you have a little bit of time, you don't have to go to class, you can, you can explore around. But, but we want to make sure we're here and we finish on time so everybody has plenty of time to drive back to campus without speeding for their new classes. So that's our, that's our thing. Um, so so with, with, without further ado, I'm gonna introduce uh, my colleague, Aurora's Gay. So she is, what, what's your official term? Chief, the Deputy Chief, Director. Chief Deputy Director. Um, Chief Deputy Executive Officer of the Mountains Recreation and Conservation. And I think I've known her for about 15 years, it's something like that. So a fantastic mm -hmm. steward of our resource, an incredibly knowledgeable person about, in particular, all the different land use dynamics that go on in the Santa Monica Mountains and, and related things. So um, with that, we're ready. Hi, welcome everybody. And probably wondering how we came to get this property, which has all those restrictions on the road. So Barbara Streisand donated this property to the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy late 1993. And the residents of Ramirez Canyon Road heard about it and went, they flipped out. They tried to get an injunction to stop her from making the donation. Many times. They yeah, did yeah. Many, many then times. Then in litigation over and over. That's why it's so, it's not, they really were afraid of the great unwashed, the public. That would be all of us. <laughs> all of you guys. They want yeah. you guys here. Yeah. So we had to develop programs to make to make this more uh, more usable. So we did. We had our offices here. Um, we were here for gosh, from like '95 until the uh, fire. Um, Woolsey. Woolsey fire uh, had us uh, have to evacuate, um, and uh, and we developed. All kinds of, we had uh, docent-led programs, we had veterans groups, we had like by invitation and by reservation groups coming in, but we had to meet the very strict traffic regulations that both the Coastal uh, Commission and the City of Malibu imposed on us. So thank you for carpooling. <laughs> I'm not so worried about the residents anymore, but nonetheless, it's good not to have too much traffic on the road. Uh, we did build a pole access camp in the back here. We have not been able to use it very often since COVID or the fire, but it, we do hope to rev that up sometime in the future. So and that's ADA, that's, that's, that's folks that have mobility challenges and stuff like that, so people that can't get to some of our other parks, it's a, it's in a, as you can see, they can just drive in on the, on the nice roads. Yeah, yeah, right. And so a little history of the Conservancy, it was actually put in place in the late 1970s, there was, right after the California Coastal Commission was established, uh, there was a move to try and protect the Santa Monica Mountains, and there was a Santa Monica Mountains Planning Commission that developed a report, um, and it, the original idea was that it would be a commission that would have zoning regulation and be able to, you know, hammer down on rampant development, which was really the, the order of the day in the late 70s. I mean, the mountains were getting scarified and bulldozed. However, cooler heads prevailed. There was so much opposition to that, obviously, from local governments and realtors and our electeds at that time, that the idea of developing a conservancy was promulgated. And so we were formed by legislation in 1979, came into effect in 1980, and uh, uh, the idea was it was just going to be a sunsetted Organization. It was just going to acquire land, turn it over to the National Park Service, and go away. It was right when it was right when the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area was coming into being. So right. this this was sort of like a state a state yeah. state comp, uh, complementary to the federal and stuff. Right. right. And uh, the early days were a little bit strenuous. We had our offices were in downtown LA in the old state office building, which I think has since been demolished. Um, but it was a lot of job owning with developers and property owners trying to buy properties that, that were identified in the comprehensive plan as being key of all the, all the usual planning principles, you know, uh, uh, 
access, for recreational access, habitat preservation. And it was actually kind of ahead of its time because my boss, Joe Edmiston, actually commissioned studies from Dr. Michael Soule and uh, some scientists at UC Santa Cruz to look at what needed to be done to really preserve the most habitat and got some great recommendations about don't, don't try to preserve just the pristine spots in the middle of the mountains, which was kind of the Park Service model for many years. Get the places that have, will enhance connectivity. And, you know, fast forwarding, that's, that's really the, the success of our wildlife crossing, our bridge at Liberty Canyon in Agoura Hills. Not completed yet, but <laughs> under construction, if you've ever driven down the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because we were sort of in the midst of trying to get property and there was so much interest from the public and user groups, Sierra Club, et cetera, to get more land acquired, there was a bond measure in the early 80s that provided some park funding. Um, then there was legislation to extend our sunset date from 1984 to later. And eventually, in the early 90s, we were made a permanent state agency, which sort of took a lot of the pressure off. And people said, there's enough to do. And also in the 80s, uh, our original zone was basically just the Santa Monica Mountains and a little bit of the Simi Hills. So from Point Magoo down to uh, Dodger Stadium, Griffith Park area. Uh, and then people in Glendale, Pasadena, and Points North said, hey, we want what you're doing. Let, let's include us. So there was new legislation called the Rim of the Valley Trail Corridor Bill, which established a much broader area. You can see it in the, the maps. You can all take a map when you go. Uh, and uh, it really was a, a real game changer because then we had an even broader constituency uh, advocating for more park bond money, for more advocacy in terms of trying to preserve habitat and public recreation areas. Um, let's see, where, where, where can I jump to from here? Well, early, also in the early 90s, LA County was realizing that there needed to be more money to do these kinds of things, to buy key properties and to provide, to upgrade facilities and provide access. And so uh, my boss, Joe, and Esther Feldman, who worked for us at the time, uh, developed a, uh, the idea of doing a, an initiative, a county initiative, to provide park funding. It was the original Proposition A, which was a parcel tax at the time. Every every parcel in LA County would contribute, I think at that time it was like $20 or $30 a year, for um, park purposes and habitat purposes. And that the first go around, I think it was called Measure B, didn't, didn't pass the next year, it did. And that really was the genesis for a lot of cool acquisitions, and also our beginnings of our Los Angeles River restoration planning, because uh, I hadn't specified money for LA River. Uh, then in 96, there was a sort of a son of Prop A, which even expanded it more. Um, really, really big, big uh, amounts of money that uh, we were able, that were assigned to the Conservancy here in Marseille, and also all the local cities and park districts and, and whatever. Um, let me back up a little bit. So in the mid-80s, so we were the state agency, the conservancy, but we had sort of a limited ability. We bought Circle X Ranch from the Boy Scouts, which is the highest point on the Santa Monica Mountains, not sort of way above the campus. Um, but we didn't really have any way to manage it because our in the state you, you have a specified number of positions and you have to get approval and there's no way we were going to get park ranger or park maintenance staff uh, out of the Department of Finance. <laughs> <laughs> and the then general manager of the Caneo Recreation and Park District, Tex Ward, had suggested, Joe, how about a joint powers authority? And there had already been one established that Tex spearheaded in that was an open called the Caneo Open Space Conservation Agency. That was a JPA with the city of Thousand Oaks and the Caneo Rec and Park District. And that's a great idea. We are at that time trying to save an appropriation to buy the picnic grounds at Lake Sherwood. Um, there's so many land use battles. <laughs> I go on and on. But anyway, uh, that money was going to revert because the appropriation had, had, didn't have a willing seller with Dayton Realty or with Murdoch. Um, and 
So that money was then allocated and sort of regranted it to this new JPA, and that provided some funding for other acquisitions in the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, also at that time, there was a, a grant we had made, a conservancy grant to the Rancho Sami Recreation and Park District to try to buy China Flat, which is the upper end of Palo Camado Canyon, all owned by Bob Hope. He, had, he was the largest private landowner in the Santa Monica Mountains for many years. <laughs> and Hope said, no, I'm not carving up my land. You can buy all of it for 30 million. He said, oh, we couldn't possibly do that. <laughs> and uh, so we formed the JPA with Rancho Sami and actually added them to the MRCA. So it's now a four-person four -person board, one elected rep from the New Record Park District, one the general manager of Rancho Sami, um, a conservancy representative, and a public member chosen by the other members. And it's, it's sort of the powerhouse for making things happen for us. Conservancy is the umbrella organization. We set the policy. We have a lot of the grant funding. But MRCA employs all of our, our real on-the-ground folks. Firefighters. Firefighters, rangers. park rangers, landscape architects, park maintenance folks. Um, the finance team, which keeps getting bigger and bigger, because it's so complicated. All the all the funding sources. So, need. so to be clear, so these two two entities are working in combination now, right? So there's one that's sort of the organizer, strategy, buy stuff, and then the other one is the land holder, the land manager, the land the, the doer of stuff, uh, managing parking lots and people and stuff like that. Yeah, cool. exactly. And actually, MRC does most of our land acquisition now because. For the state to buy land or even get donated land is a very cumbersome process. If you've ever heard, there's something called the State Public Works Board, which opines on whether state parks or uh, coastal conservancy, whatever, want to buy property. We have to say, well, I don't know. That puts liability on the state to own property. Uh, so <laughs> we bypass that by just giving, granting the funds to MRCA, and they can move quicker too. And landowners don't want to wait around for a year and a half to see if. Public Works Board is going to approve their acquisition. And then I'll add that we all, there's also a, other partners, most prominently a Trust for Public Lands um, and, and, and some other NGOs that, that can also partner as well to help with like securing funds and sometimes sometimes they might acquire a land first or, or whatever. So so there's several partners that, that, yeah, that collaborate. Nature Conservancy. Or Nature Conservancy. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, TPL basically acts like an environmental land broker, like a real estate agent. They don't provide their own funding, but they they negotiate with landowners and sometimes work out the, the deal so they can pay. Uh, we have to have a state-approved appraisal before we spend any public money on, on land. And uh, often a landowner wants to have a tax write-off or we'll make a charitable donation by reducing uh, the asking price from what the appraised value is. Uh, let's see, in the 90s, there were lots of land use controversies. <laughs> mainly, mainly revolving around what was the so-called Bob Hope land deal. Uh, that involved all the land, basically the land uh, north of the 101 in Ogura, Palo Camado Canyon, Cheeseboro Canyon, the former Amundsen Ranch. And Hope also owned a property here in Malibu called Corral Canyon, which is now Conservancy Park land. And a big chunk north of the 118 freeway, Rocky Peak Park. Which, what is now Rocky Peak Park. Uh, and that's another key wildlife linkage spot. There is a tunnel under the 118 there that animals actually do use. So we were embroiled in all kinds of things then, along with our first and only condemnation effort for the former Soka University site on uh, Las Virginis and Mulholland. That was a long fought battle, battle, also lots of litigation on that. We gave up the condemnation because, again, that was going to be a 30 to $40 million purchase, and we didn't have the funds to do that. But that, that's sort of the, the long-term point I want to make, is that it, you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, and eventually a lot of those folks come to the table and say, buy me out, I give up. <laughs> or their kids do. Yeah, or exactly. Or their grandkids do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so eventually we were able to purchase the former um, Soka University site, which was originally owned by King Camp Gillette, the safety razor magnate, bought it in the 1920s and developed, had a 
beautiful architectural scheme with Wallace Neff, who was an architect to the stars in Hollywood, lots of Spanish revival kind of architecture. And of course, originally, King Gillette was uh, Chumash and Tongva and Fernandinho Tataviam land. There's a really important village site on the, in that corridor. And, and, and that's that's where our new joint um, joint visitor center is now. If you guys have visited there, um, so it's yeah. us and the Park Service and you know state, local, state, and federal uh, interpretive interpretation center. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful spot. If you haven't been, go and take your take your families. It's really cool, and it's open every day, <laughs> unlike this spot. <laughs> uh, let's see, where did I leave off? The nineties. The nineties. Okay, so we finally. We finally got uh, the, the HOPE deal settled when um, it was then Home Savings and Loan had uh, acquired, actually Ventura County had approved a specific plan to build uh, on uh, Amundsen Ranch and with the caveat that all the rest of HOPE's land had to be donated to the Conservancy or MRCA. And that, that went through, we got uh, Upper Las Virginas Canyon, at the very end of Las Virginas Road, which is the north of the 101 at Hillman's at the property line. It's all in Ventura County. You can only get to it through LA County roads. Um, and so we embarked on, uh, then the, the, the controversy was people were very upset about the idea of develop anything on Amundsen Ranch, Lasky Mesa, which is a, it's a 5, 000, total 5,000 acre property. We had already acquired 2,500 acres of it, and the remaining 3,000 was in play. So lots of lawsuits, uh, not against us, but against Home Savings and Loan. Um, they gave up and turned over all their properties to Washington Mutual Bank, which really wasn't in the land development business, but they had, <laughs> you know, it was an asset, so they were trying to deal with it. And the vision was to turn that into like a mini city, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a yeah. big, big development. housing units, hotels, commercial center, mostly all on Lasky Mesa, which is like... Amundsen Ranch. So just on the other side of the 101, if you drive up to the to the 101 right now. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it was a really premier property. And we managed, there was a Proposition 50 was, was being developed at that time on the state ballot. Uh, we uh, managed to get it written in so that there was funding to the Wildlife Conservation Board, another very important state agency uh, that would essentially wrote out, didn't say Amundsen Ranch, but it was obvious that <laughs> it was a spot that had to have funding. Also, I included uh, the Bayona Wetlands as another yep. village in the ranch. So we had the, we knew the money was in place, that's when Washington Mutual came to us and said, okay, buy us out. We'd like, we think it's worth 170 million, and our appraisal came in at like 140 million. We said, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, Wildlife Conservation Board put in the most of that, 135. State Coastal Conservancy added another 10, and uh, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy put in five. So by two, late 2003, we owned this beautiful, the, the entirety of the former Amundsen Ranch. You guys should all clap. That was a major achievement. That was a major achievement. And uh, so much thorn and drawn over that whole <laughs> effort, but we made it. We had Hollywood all involved. Rob Reiner is, we took a bus of protesters up to Seattle to protest in front of Washington Mutual headquarters. I mean, it was drama. But I, I, I think that was what motivated Wamu to sell, but they just, they just wanted to get it off our books, let's, let's right. it over go forward. So that was a huge win, and then soon thereafter, in the, the next year is when the people that ran Sofu University, with, or based, in, based in Japan, uh, approached then County Supervisor Zeb Yaroslavsky, uh, saying, okay, if we sell the property, what, what can we use it for? And their idea was estates, because of many uh, large lot parcels, many parcels, and by right, every parcel could host a house, or a cemetery, I think, or a 
lot of skis. And Zev said, talk to Joe Edmiston. <laughs> and hence the deal evolved that we could buy Soak for actually about what the original appraisal was that we had to give up on the condemnation action. And that was also a multi-party uh, scheme. We had conservancy money, coastal conservancy money, wildlife conservation board money, city of Agoura Hills and city of Westside Village actually each chipped in a little bit. Uh, the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission had some, so we actually accumulated the, the amount to actually buy that property from us. And we took it over in 2000. They, the deal finalized in 2005, but they wanted to matriculate the last of their, um, they had a grad student program with like about 12 kids, hundreds of people, and they ran uh, language camps from, they would bring over kids from Japan and do like a 12 language camp. They wanted to get those all out of the way. So in 2007, we actually took over operations and running a park, whether it's this one or Amundsen Ranch, but we don't call it Amundsen, it's, it's Upper Las Virgins. <laughs> and, uh, the seller said, you, we don't want you to use that name, it's Brittany the Redeem. No longer called Amundsen Ranch. But in, in any event, um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought here. Um, We're uh, talking about um, uh, Soka. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. So we needed We do, MRCA is, has to be very entrepreneurial. We have weddings, we have uh, commercials and movie shoots. Um, all those things help generate the revenue to actually pay for you know, emptying the trash and having the ranger patrols and the fire patrols. It's, it's an ongoing effort. We're always seeking maintenance money. With state bond money, you can't, you can only use that for capital. Capital projects, either building something or something that has a useful life of a number of years. And that's why we get no money from the state for maintaining any of the properties we own, whether they're owned by the Conservancy or MRCA. Hence, it's, a, it's a, uh, an engine. <laughs> uh, some of our properties, like downtown, the Los Angeles River Center and Gardens, we have a big that was the former Lowry's California Center, uh, that hosts weddings. Practically, you know, over every weekend there's two or three going on. It's a, it's a very popular spot to have a wedding or a quinceanera or a graduation party. And that provides a lot of fun to you. I would say some of the themes that start coming in more in the 90s are uh, some early 2000s, I guess. Uh, some of the critiques are that the stuff we're doing, right? is in the coastal zone or is in wealthy Malibu, right? Like, well, that's cool, but what about parks elsewhere? So we start leaning a bit more into, um, you know, uh, urban parks in the San Fernando Valley and the restoration of the LA River and all these other cool things, as well as disasters. I'd say natural hazards become more apparent. And so we start upping planning um, to deal with wildfire and things like that. Absolutely, yeah. In fact, in the 90s, it was our wake up call. There was a fire that was called the Dependent Fire that was in 1996, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and it came from the, the sort of the, the usual route and the Santa Ana wind driven fire from the Santa Susana Mountains, straight down to Panga Canyon, Malibu Canyon, and we had a park, or have a park in Red Rock Canyon in Old Topanga. Uh, and my boss Joe and one of the rangers were on a roof trying to wet it down, and the county helicopters are going over. They weren't, said, oh, that's parkland. We don't have to deal with that. <laughs> that was our wake up. We have to protect our own properties. And that was sort of the genesis of developing um, a trained and, and resilient fire crew. Starting out with, at first they were like uh, surplus engine, fire engines from other departments, but we now have a very robust, robust program. Um, with drones, with year-round fire prevention, all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Type, a number of Type 3 engines, which are the four-wheel drive engines that can go up into wildland, um, train seasonal firefighters every year. And a lot of those do either stay with us or go on to jobs with CAL FIRE or the U.S. Uh, Forest Service. So we're definitely an incubator. And as Sean mentioned, we were also focused on the inner, inner city underused areas 
uh, a big project we embarked on in the late 1990s and early 2000s was developing nature parks in what otherwise were urban locations. Um, one of the best was uh, Augustus Hawkins Natural Park, which is in south central LA at the corner of Compton and Slauson Avenues. It's a whole city block owned by Department of Water and Power. Uh, it was where this shows them where pipes went to die. It was just <laughs> all kinds of distorted stuff there. And a then city council in the city of Los Angeles, Rita Walters, had challenged Joe on it up at Reseda Park while we were trying to develop a trail. How do, how do you get this to my people? I want this for my people. And that was sort of, aha, let's, let's get the pipes off. <laughs> let's develop uh, an actual native habitat park that's accessible to the community. And it was a huge success. We actually built it in a year. Started in January of 2000. Uh, the dates are escaping. We got it completed by December of the next year. And then uh, Governor Ray Davis came for the dedication, which was very exciting. And we ran it for a number of years. And then uh, LA City Rec and Parks took it over. So they, they actually run it now. Because it's not, it's not land we own anyway, it was city property. How much did that one cost to build? To build? Oh, probably, I guess, I'm just going to guess here, I think probably around 10 million. And a lot of that came from LA County Prop A funds, and also we did a Proposition 12 Conservancy Grant. Even though it was not in our Conservancy Zone, Prop 12 was very really flexible on the I'd say another. I'd say another theme that sort of has come up is uh, in because of the powerful interests and in, in stuff in in and around the Santa Monica Mountains. People aren't really interested in selling, but if they do sell, like that's cool. But they don't really want other people to come. And so, so this place is is a great example of this this trend of by the time you get to the '90s and and stuff, people are like, that's great. We'll leave this aside. So I have a nice view. But let's not have it so that, you know, the riffraff can come on in and use this. Yeah, Malibu is <laughs> the central. <laughs> kind of yeah, I mean, people like people in Sacramento would say, "Well, why do you need money from us? You got all those rich people and moving people. Don't they want to donate? You know, <laughs> they want us to buy their backyard, but they don't really want to contribute. To it. They have other charitable causes." That and, and then also the LA River was another big, big effort. So we started a little um, soft bottom part of the river and it went, it's called the Glendale Narrows. Um, we bought a little piece of, it was the end of a street, Marsh, I don't know, um, the road all the way. Anyway, it was in sort of the Atwater Village part of uh, LA. And uh, that area had been cut off by the five freeway. Um, it was, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people had lived there for many years. They owned their own homes, but it, but it was working class. But they really didn't have any access to parkland. And so we created these little pocket parks along the river that the community uses all the time. And we, had some, we knew it was a success when every elected official wanted to do one of their you know, announcements or press announcements at one of our river parks because they were beautiful and <laughs> there was a great audience of people to come and see them. Uh, going back to Richard Reed. I'd say another example of that is um, uh, trying to restore the LA River and, and deconcretize it. There's a chunk that is not concrete in and around the Sepulveda Basin. And so the MRCA has also been one of the leaders in, in doing um, uh, public kayaking uh, tours that you guys can sign up for in not this time of year, but, but in, in other times of the year, which has been a great success. Oh, okay, sorry, I've been there a couple weeks. Yeah, that was uh, the what? Yeah, canoe. Yeah. I've never even seen more than like this much water. Well, it depends on where you are. In the Sepulveda Basin, it looks like the bayous. Yeah, it's very, very lush. And then in the uh, Glendale Narrow section, it's also soft bottom, but has a lot more rocks and ripples. And it's Army Corps of Engineers wasn't able to completely encase that property because the groundwater is so high that there was no point in trying to. 
And that LA River effort uh, continues on. Also, Sepulveda Basin. The city is now trying to develop its Sepulveda Basin master plan in time for the Olympics. And we, we actually got unexpectedly a big uh, appropriation through Senator Stern to assist the city in that effort. So we'll see what transpires with that. Now, also in the 90s, we were really active in trying to acquire property in the River of the Valley Trail Corridor. So one great example is the so-called Santa Clarita Woodlands. This is the property that's on the south side of the five freeway as you go through the Newhall Pass. And if you've never been there, there are big home Douglas fir. <laughs> and in fact, there's sort of a remnant population, probably from a cooler and wetter era, but uh, they, they still persist. And Five species of oak. It's just it's a wildlife paradise. It's all kinds of critters live there. So Chevron owned a lot of the property because they that oil had been discovered there in the 1870s. And in fact, the first commercially successful oil well was drilled in Pico Canyon, uh, which is part of Santa Cruz Woodlands, in, 19, in 1876. Chevron was also trying to develop. They had a real estate arm uh, and wanted to get uh, entitled us to develop the area in that location. And um, we entreated the vice president of Chevron, a gentleman named Wally Aston, went to his office and said, Look at all this. This is beautiful. There are waterfalls, there are black bear, there's mountain lions. You don't want to develop this. Sell to us. And they did. <laughs> and that was funded by Proposition A. That was a really big win. Um, and then they donated 850 acres in Pico Canyon, which has uh, encompasses an entry level. It's a, a little town that was built by the first superintendent of the Chevron real estate. And very popular in that neck of the woods. So that and then other Asian Wilderness Park in Glendale, uh, next to a historic winery. Uh, the city of Glendale was really ha ha wanted so much to have that preserved. Uh, and then they, they mandated that we named after former Governor Dick Major. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't very kind to us. <laughs> I want to talk about, uh, I think, when I think about the most contentious votes that we've had, I think the most contentious vote that I can recall is the edge property stuff. So you want to talk about that little, what would that, that story and what, and what that, this was a, an, an interest to build, develop a, a property um, on the ridge line up here. So East side of Melbourne Canyon, just looks down on Melbourne Road. So it went to the Coastal Commission, the county, and eventually, um, I can't even remember the outcome, but now he's a willing seller. Well, so, so, so it's interesting because. I think for, for you guys, so you can understand, so this was a you know big, powerful musician that's used to kind of getting his way and was trying to do stuff, and said, no, it's cool, I'm going to do this as an eco-development, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, but in... Low impact. Low impact, but has to build this massive, massive road up where there's no road and all these things, and, and very savvy. So folks now, I think many folks understand that um, there's value in, in keeping you know, coastal systems intact and all that kind of good stuff. But um, in the case of the edge, he had very smart lawyers and he realized that we had, that the agency has multiple goals, one of which is public access. And so the idea was, hey, if you guys, it, so the conservancy um, couldn't necessarily block what he wanted to do, but, but would comment on, the environmental impact reviews and all that kind of good stuff. And <clears throat> and so, and oftentimes what the Conservancy says is taken very, very seriously. And so we initially said, yeah, this isn't a good idea. And and there was an offer made that, well, if you not, you don't have to approve the project, but if you just drop your 
opposition, these other parcels of land that you really need to complete some of these other parts of your goals, this trail system that, that, it's on, that are on private property that the owners would never sell to us, like I've convinced them to, to give you guys right away. So try to use, so when you can't sort of fight something, you can use other, other levers. And so the interest was to see if the conservancy would back down on their opposition so that they could acquire other, um, achieve other goals in their portfolio. And I wouldn't say, say back down, but certainly modify that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And with Goa, as, as with the sort of a trend with a lot of these properties, he's now a level seven. And so that's, that's sort of the thing. It wasn't developed, and it wasn't developed. No. Yeah, right. No. Now to see, okay, how can we accumulate the funds and have a new appraisal outstanding, and trying to wait to see if that gets approved, or just close the development. And he owns two properties, that those water basin property, which was the development commission, but also another key property here, our former headquarters part of the Solstice Canyon. And then, and then maybe the last one. We'll, we'll probably we'll talk more about this. But can we? You want to talk about? Um, so, uh, in particular, in the immediate shoreline, right? One of the reasons the Coastal um, Act was passed in the first place was people were worried about um, uh, property, a, a chunk of area north of. Um, uh, San Francisco and then Malibu. And people were really worried people were privatizing the coast. <clears throat> and so, um, so we'll talk more about that when we get to the Coast Commission. But, um, but the owners of those properties now in Malibu maybe don't like to let people onto their property. And so we have a few examples of, um, but one, one high profile one just that's currently ongoing where um, the owner, or not the owner, the um, the next door neighbors have fenced off the access point, and illegal fence. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just like put up a fence across, like so that you can't get to the beach. And it looks, you know, most people, if you're driving by, it looks like, oh, that's somebody's private thing. I don't want to, I don't want to try to climb the fence or whatever. Like, why would I climb the fence? And so it's all about perception. It's all about implying that you shouldn't be here. It's all about. Yes, yes, yeah. having all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Security guards mm -hmm. on the beach. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a big part to our coastal access program. So we, we actually, it's the Coastal Conservancy actually has jurisdiction of the coast. However, they've acquired a lot of um, access easements, and they didn't have a way. They had a nonprofit that was supposed to manage them, and that sort of went under. So MRCA now handles a lot of those access ways. And our rangers actually patrol them. We issue tickets for dogs on the beach, which I don't mind a dog on the beach, but it's actually a county ordinance. And to the uh, dismay and disgruntlement <laughs> of a lot of the folks that live on the beach, well, I live here, but you can't give me a ticket. <laughs> 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 but that, that particular property driver was been so. We checked with Coastal Commission, they said take the fence today, and remove the fence, and then the neighbors went uh, very holistic, and they were um, calling the governor's office and everything else. So there was a lot of pushback, but we still don't have the fence. Up. Put the fence back up, and then it was taken down again, and it's, yeah, it's been a battle. So it's, and it's huge. I mean, people, because you can drive, know all this stuff about, oh, it's an accident alley, and people are trying to park there to go to the beach, you'll have mayhem and blood on the PCH. There were no such statistics for that, and we haven't had any issues. And it's a popular spot where you could just pull over, walk down to the beach, and there are, we don't have facilities because we don't really, uh, we don't have a permit to do that yet, but at some point, love to get a quarter pot and have other uh, facilities there. Where is this exactly? It's, um, it's called Carbon La Costa. It's oh, south of the main part of town. Um, I don't know. By, by Big Rock kind of area. Yeah, is the, the private gate at Little Doom here, is that legal or is that? Mm. Yeah, Little Doom. Paradise Cove? Yeah, like just north of Paradise Cove. 
Um, like the beaches in between Paradise Cove and Point Doom? I think it may be, but we have, we just got a court uh, decision from a property for a project in the south that does have a dedicated easement mm -hmm. that we, the, the owners have sort of obscured it with vegetation and the drive away from there and they have to allow access there. Mm -hmm. That Paradise Cove is an interesting spot. Is there, is there, um, do you guys ever have uh, find yourselves having to sell certain properties, and if so, what would be the reason? Uh, certain, certain like. Do we ever sell properties? Public properties are contested by the agencies. So. Uh, we do have the the ability, the legal ability, to buy and sell property. So if somebody donated something to us that had uh, an environmental value, we could actually put that on the market and sell it, like either to an adjacent owner. So, money back into it. Uh, but it's not a usual practice. I mean, you often get, I'll get calls. Hi, I'm a realtor, and my client really needs to have more room for his tennis court. And you, you don't really need that property next to it. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> so that doesn't work out very often. <laughs> uh, the Chusa Beach is a, has been a long standing. We actually started that in 20 years ago because Costa Conservancy gave us $10 million to buy the property. Um, it's actually beach. And we said, well, nobody can build on that. However, <laughs> not exactly true. So we bought the property and then have been in a 20 year effort to get a conditional use permits to actually keep the access going and to provide a restroom and ADA access for a vehicle. And it's all, we're almost there. It's a beautiful beach. What beach is it? Lechusa. It's, it's like near uh, Broad Beach. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like up by Crankus? Uh, uh, not, not too far from Crankus. Okay. So, yeah, it would be the old, old Pacific Coast Highway section. Okay. And uh, it, it's a little obscure, but we have apps that tell people how to get there. That's first. You're always... It's like, yeah. It's like yeah. a little trail Yeah. And another project we're really proud of is we've always tried to promote having communities come out to our parks and also to the beach. So we sponsor um, groups like Mujeres de la Tierra and... Uh, Become beautiful. Yeah. Get a bus, come out to the beach, have a lifeguard, they have to pay for a lifeguard. Our rangers will be there to talk to them about park careers and safety and uh, some of these kids have you know, never been to the beach before, so it's a great, great day at the beach for folks, and then they know how to come back with their parents. Yeah, and some of our camping uh, uh, experiences here, people have never seen the stars sometimes, right? People that are in the city with all the light pollution and stuff, so uh, important to have these opportunities close to town. Yeah. And so project, our big project right now is, uh, the one I'm totally working on is our fire resiliency projects. We've got some great appropriations unexpectedly to provide grants for structure hardening, ignition prevention, workforce development, um, you know, all those good things. And we've employed, we, we spent out our first tranche already, we've got it all out and working on the uh, second and third tranches. And some of your previous colleagues, some of, your, some of our alums work, work either work for or have worked for uh, these guys. So it's also a thing you guys should consider uh, as a possible yeah. opportunity. GIS people and yeah. planners and various things. Careers was a program we had, mainly looking at underserved LA Conservation Corps members to get them sort of inculcated in what it would take to become a landscape architect or a planner or a ranger or park operations staff. And a lot of those folks are now with us now. Um, the other big project is, of course, the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing over the 101 freeway. And that, that's been decades in the making also. So Paul Edelman, my colleague, actually he wrote his master's thesis in the late 1980s on critical habitat linkages between the South and the City Hills and Santa Susana's. And he ID'd a lot of these places like Hoogie Canyon, Rocky Peak, and uh, in the New Hall Pass mm -hmm. to make sure that there was some way to get, to, to at least show that there were uh, places that are barriers to, to wildlife moving. And that informed a lot of our land acquisition strategy too. So 
We said, okay, we need to buy both sides of the 101 that live in the community. One side was commercially zoned, it had a big billboard that said, future home of Carpeteria. Carpeteria. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we got some pushback from some folks saying, well, that's commercially zoned property, that's useless, it's awful weeds, you know, you can't spend money on it. But <laughs> no, we need it. <laughs> and, and like I said, on the south side, there was a gentleman named Al Abrams who wanted to do a big development and then wound up selling to us in the National Park Service. So hence, we have, we own both sides of the freeway, MRCA does, and um, uh, 10 years ago, we did a big meeting with Caltrans and uh, then Senator Van Pavley, uh, National Park Service, and we said, okay, what's it gonna take? At that point, there'd been a, a line that actually crossed from the Simi Hills and crossed over the 101 and then ran into a, the big sound wall uh, south of Liberty Canyon and ran back across and got hit. And that was just so tragic and we were so upset. So, okay, let's, what can we do? And we were thinking early on with that, if we could just widen the drainage culvert under the 101, that could be a spot. But our park service plan just said, nah, freeway is too wide, it makes a bend, it doesn't have any light in the middle. You know, it, it's not ideal. A bridge would be good. And Caltrans said, yeah, we can build a bridge. You can give us the money. <laughs> and my boss, Joe, said, this will be a nationwide campaign. People will love it. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> but it's true. We have uh, Park Service uh, got Beth Pratt with the National Wildlife Federation on board to raise money. And she's just done an amazing job. She's our, she's our, Joan of Arc for the Wildlife Crossing. Um, Wallace Annenberg, it's a name after her because she's put in 25 million for the effort. Wildlife Conservation Board added another 25 million. Conservancy put in some. And she Beth got a bunch of other private donors. Um, William Albert DiCaprio did some of the gift. Not very much, but he gave some money for the original. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of foundations have been involved. So it's underway now, it's under construction. We're hoping it will be largely completed by late 2025. That may be a little optimistic because we had some rain delays and other issues with Edison with underground power lines and the like. But uh, at least in the next few years, we should be able to have a vegetated wildlife crossing over the 101 that also extends over the frontage road, Gura Road. So it's a, because there's a big elevation change between Road up to the freeway yet, so we need to have another another structure coming over the road. And it will all be landscaped with native plants, which are being grown right now at a nursery on MRCA land next to the fire station on Los Virgins Road and manned by the uh, Santa Monica Mountains Fund uh, and, from, and the National Park Service. So they've, they've been collecting, for years they've been collecting seeds and actually. Uh, spores and mycorrhiza and it's really in depth. <laughs> we want to make this a really true restoration of the top of the bridge. Do you think, do you see that with um, the um, Hill Mothers Insurance uh, kind of catastrophe we're sort of reaching in California, that we see more opportunities to purchase land that people are not able to sell because you can't get a loan to buy it? That's a very good idea. I'm not sure it hasn't, it hasn't. <laughs> 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 There's no way to get to it. It's in the middle of somewhere on a slope somewhere or something. Yeah, totally unbuildable. Um, although I should, should say that nothing is totally unbuildable. But so we have a huge inventory of donated land, mm. both little parcels and great big parcels. One of our most recent large acquisitions is north of 
the 126 freeway uh, near Lake Piru, the Hathaway Ranch or Temesco Ranch. Mm -hmm. um, that was a deal that Trusted Public Land brokered and funded mostly by the Wildlife Conservation Board. That was a big 6,000 acres, so that was a huge add to the 30 by 30 campaign, which I'm sure you've heard about. 30% of California preserved by 2030. We'll talk later about the Mansdorf, what we're now supposed to call Deer Creek uh, property, which is another example of a huge chunk of land. Uh, it, was the, it was the largest chunk of undeveloped beach between uh, Point Conception and the Mexico border. It was like two miles, two, two and a half miles, something like that, two and a half miles. And so that's another great example. I think the theme that you guys hopefully are seeing through this is that having a consistent long-term uh, priorities and agencies and capacities to do this stuff leads to opportunity. Stuff doesn't happen every day. It's sometimes, you know, boring and day in day, but it lays the groundwork, right? It, without, without the parcels on either side of the 101, you couldn't have done the, the wildlife crossing. Or, um, you know, without having this chunk of property, we couldn't get the next one and the next one, and eventually that's where we get the trails from. Those kinds of things are, are sort of day in, day out. Um, so it's important to have really competent agencies, re really nimble, or, or agencies have the capacity to be nimble when, when the case calls for it. Um, and so I think those are some themes that hopefully you guys are getting from all this. Well, well said. <laughs> yeah, the, the former Mansdorf property, that was uh, actually old man Mansdorf had promoted as a nat liquefied natural gas port. Yeah, he wanted to put a port. This is in up the coast, right yeah. here, in the, like crazy. Deer Creek, everything. Crazy. Everyone crashes their cars all the time. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right, exactly. And actually, it was actually part of the EI, or NEPA process. They were identifying spots along the California coast where there could be an LNG port. Portland, Miami was another one that was named. What does NEPA stand for? Liquefied natural gas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Not, not well, when you said, when you said, you said NEPA, or? Oh, I don't know. NEPA's National Environmental Protection Act. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no, right? It's on the acronyms, I know. <laughs> CEQA and NEPA. That's yeah. <laughs> Almost interchangeable. But, uh, and then he he died, his estate, I mean, the place was just a mess of title issues. And so there was no way anybody was going to be able to buy it. And there was some chicanery going on. Mm -hmm. Finally, TPL was able to unravel the knots and get a willing seller who could actually legitimately sign the documents. <laughs> it was unclear who owned different parcels because it was like, is this mine or is this my... Girlfriend, whatever the term is, <laughs> yeah. I give it to her, and it was so it was all completely. It's so hard to keep track of all my uh, Yeah. And it's yeah. very, I mean, it's mostly uphill, but it has Euro streams, very rugged, but there's a big promontory where we actually did the, the uh, press announcement uh, that would be a fantastic spot for whale watching. And National Park Service will acquire that property. They're, they're supposed to take it and develop a plan, which may take a while, but <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And then plus two and a half miles of beach. I mean, that was a real, I didn't even realize that the property included that much beach footage. It's awesome. It's very, awesome. Very cool. So um, I want to give you guys a few minutes to meander around before we uh, uh, dissipate. But um, did anybody else have some questions for Rory while we're still here? However, during the environmental process that the Caltrans had, the, uh, the overwhelming uh, comment from members of the public was, wildlife only, we don't want people on it. So, okay. so truth be told, it may be hard to keep people on. Yes, it will be hard to keep so people on. We have some management issues we're talking about when we're planting wild rose and poison oak on you know, beware of rattlesnake signs, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the National Wildlife Federation is actually developing a, a docent cohort that will lead hikes. What? Docents? What is that? That would be like volunteer hike leaders. Oh. Yeah, to sort of escort people or educate people. Maybe have a little so chair at the bottom. So naturalists kind of walk around people. So the design is like designed no humans. Like that's right. what they have. Okay. Right. And do you know like how wide? It is. Uh, it's 170 feet wide and 279 feet long. It's big. Yeah. That's, that's it's Higante. Wow. Yeah, yay Caltrans. I mean, they, District 7 of Caltrans has really embraced this 
project which is sort of a surprise from the top down. Tony Tavares is the head of Caltrans in Sacramento and is all on board with it. So that's a good thing. Do we just assume that animals are just going to find their way there, or is there like a different pro is there a process of knowing where is the best location? No best location because animals have sort of stopped on both sides. You know, like Park Service tracks a lot of animals. They've got some color collars on the mule deer now too, and mountain lions and coyotes. And so we don't think it'll be a problem for the animals to find it. Well, there will be some fencing to keep them from jumping off onto like a, a funnel, a fence funnel kind of thing. Yeah, and David Szymanski with the Park Service jumped and said, "Well, we could drag a dead deer over." The <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> no, then they will come. That's, that's the message. You may have seen some videos of there's a crossing in Utah that's just basically it's just gravel and rocks, but the video shows moose. I didn't know there were moose in Utah. Bear, <laughs> deer. Just, that's just crossing a small railway road. And it's mainly just, it wasn't so much a habitat, it's just to make the connection. Yeah. I was wondering. No counties have been worked except it's all in it. Uh, state bonds for, for natural resources or private donations. About half and half. Yeah, but one of the one of the most interesting things is now that this is sort of already um, happening is there's uh, the next level is to create a fund for places that aren't sexy, for other areas around California that could benefit from a wildlife crossing but don't have the capacity to raise that type of money, and so the next thing is to to work on increasing this endowment so that different jurisdictions can use that for their really, really important early planning to sort of justify and figure out what it might cost and that kind of stuff. And that will benefit the whole state. Absolutely. And in fact, there's been legislation that now requires Caltrans to consider wildlife movement for any new uh, road stuff. project they do. Um, so it's got a lot of legs. And there's a cross-country trip going on right now with the National Wildlife Federation and a... Uh, Nonprofit uh, and the Steve Winter, who was the National Geographic photographer, who got that iconic photo of P22 against the Hollywood sign. They are in the midst of traveling from here, we started out last Friday, uh, across the southern United States to other spots where there are existing <coughs> crossings or needs for crossing. And it's part of a fundraising campaign that Wallace Annenberg made a challenge grant to that same thing. You know, put in 10 million. Get more, get more funds going. Cool. Very cool. Other questions? Can we walk upstairs? Uh, sure, sure, sure. And I was just saying, when you do these that you all hear, just drive straight ahead, on the grip, past this. It's a little narrow, but you'll get it, and then you'll see a fork in the road to go uphill, and it takes you back down to the main entrance part. And so I'll just also say, so let's first thank Roy. That was great. That was great. Thank you, guys. And so our, th our theme this week is about, you know, uh, uh, challenges and, and responding and, and what, are these, what are these challenges and how do we respond. And I would suggest that um, one type of response is having an effective land use, land acquisition, land management agency to deal with some of those. Not all the, all, not all the challenges we talked about, but almost everything we talked about, um, you could see examples in here. Dealing with invasive species, dealing with climate change, um, fragmentation. All, we didn't. We don't really touch on over harvesting so much here, but but um, institutional inefficiencies or how do we have organizations work? Um, this is an example of something that I would argue seems to be working fairly well. You can you can suggest otherwise, but but um, one example as we go forward to look back on and, and, and reference as we go forward. Awesome! Great! Thank you.